Welcome to Ask.js Orgs. So today I'm gonna show you a new top 10 sight and sound palette that I created last night. I think it's a really fun exercise to try to think of 10 films that I would have for a sight and sound palette if they ever ask me to do one. Of course they never will, but I still like to speculate on that particular topic and at least. Yeah. And I also ended up creating a top 10 palette for my alter ego because I felt like I wanted to have some humor in this video too. And then in the end I'm also gonna show you a top 10 palette from one of my dearest friends and also a weaver of this channel. Yeah. But here you can see the famous top 10 from the last critics poll. Obviously this was very controversial due to the number one pick. Again it had many middle-aged men crying that there was a female directed film on the first place but again that's the society we live in men who complain that other people get offended they get offended themselves so that's fragile masculinity for you yeah but anyway i didn't have any problems with sean dillman being the number one even though again i don't think it's the greatest film of film of all time and to be honest i don't think we can even determine what is the number one greatest film, film of all time but but we can just talk about which are some of the greatest films of all time but i think Shah dilemon is a great great movie although i like many of these films on the top 10 more than it yeah but anyway i'll show you my actual top 10 first then i'll show you the alter ego one and then i'll show you the list from my dear friend that I think is really, really good as well. Yeah. But so this is my new, new one. Of course, there are many films here that have been in my previous palettes as well, but a couple of changes as well. But I'll grow, go through these quite quickly. So we have Berlin, Alexander Platz by Fassbinder first. And you might think that that's a TV show, so how can you have it here? But it has been on like sight and sound lists before so they do accept it and of course there was even twin peaks the return which is kind of similar to berlin alexander platz that it's kind of like a long mini series so yeah but to me this is just aesthetically brilliant it's like a dostoevsky novel come to life it's like very bleak and dark but also kind of hypnotic and even whimsical at the same time it's about this loser man, Franz Biberkov, who gets out of jail and tries to change his life, but then he isn't able to do that. And there are so many different types of characters, each of them with very interesting personalities and very interesting kind of inner worlds. And this show just explores so many sides of humanity, and it's also kind of an interesting historical portrait of the of Germany before it was kind of fully taken by the Nazis. Yeah. Yeah. So really, really amazing work, very difficult work, very slow work, but absolutely brilliant in my opinion. So yeah. Then we have the human condition. And I've of course often said that this might be the greatest film of all time if I have to say like one film, which is the greatest film of all time. But like I said in the beginning of the video, I think that I think in the end you cannot choose just the one greatest film of all time or one greatest book of all time or one greatest album of all time or one greatest painting of all time. But you can just kind of talk about which are some of the greatest and this definitely is one of the greatest. And as I always say, I think the title of the film is perfect, the human condition, as it really kind of goes through many different kind of parts of the human condition it feels like if you really examine this film and all of its details that you will come up with a, like a very good understanding of humanity after you've watched this trilogy and it has one of the great performances from Tatsuya Nakadai here who is a very flawed character an idealist character who gets absolutely destroyed in this film but it's a very interesting character arc very complex character arc and even a very relatable character arc i guess really relate to that type of character who has this kind of big ideals big ideas and 
ideas that very much differ from most of society. And then you kind of feel that alienation as you think so differently to most people. So you can kind of, I think I can really relate to that type of character. And I think many people who are watching this video probably can, can too. Yeah. Then we have Paths of Glory. And I think I would have very similar comments to Paths of Glory as I would have to the human condition as it really explores many of the kind of most important topics for humanity, again, kind of authoritarianism, how the average person gets fucked by the people in power. Here, obviously, we, saw, we see how soldiers are getting kind of brutalized due to their superiors and stuff. As they really don't care about anything but themselves. And it shows that hypocrisy of the people in power but also this film and also the human condition has lots of like aesthetic merit. They are very beautiful looking films. They have great performances, Paths of Glory, and also the human condition, they have lots of heart. So it's not just those political themes there and themes in general, but there is lots of other merit to both of these films as well. Yeah. But to me, Paths of Glory is actually Kubrick's greatest work. I really love the 2001 Space Odyssey, but I think Paths of Glory just has themes that are just so incredibly relevant to humanity and they've always been relevant and they will always be relevant, sadly, most likely so, yeah. But then we have Ingmar Bergman's Persona, which is just aesthetically one of the most brilliant films ever. It has some of the best performances ever. It's a very ambiguous feel. It's a very complex and layered film. You can analyze it from so many different angles. You can take it more like a psychological view on it and explore identity. But then you can also look at artistic process and creativity even at moments in the film. Um, so there is so many different kind of lenses that you can look at this film from as it has so many layers and so many things to analyze and so many details and it's just absolute perfection and I think it's Ingmar's best film and that's saying a lot as he made like a dozen masterpieces basically so yeah but then we have Sancho the Bailiff and it would also go kind of to the same category as Paths of Glory and the Human Condition as it just explore explore so many of the important themes that we humans have to tackle with, whether it's again human cruelty, whether it's personal growth, how you should try to be again, merciful to others, but how it doesn't really work out in a corrupt society. So these are very important themes. And this is also aesthetically so beautiful, like the framing of the shots, the angles, the black and white, it just looks so dark and but also very beautiful. Has incredible ending as well, one of the most memorable endings, and it just touches you so so deeply. As you can kind of see both the personal in the film, but also the wider social problems. And even though this is of course very particular to Japan, but it also feels very universal. As again, human cruelty, for example, it happens everywhere in the world in many different forms. Yeah. And societies are corrupt everywhere in the world in many different forms. So even though it's particular, you can still make it universal in your head. Yeah. Then I think I don't really have to say much about this next one, but it's Showa, uh, which I think is probably the greatest documentary ever made. Very important documentary. I think it's one that everybody should watch, whether you are a cinephile or not. It's very important to not forget the Holocaust. And it's very important to not forget what humans are capable of when they are at their worst. So yeah, it's an incredible documentary, very hard, hard to watch and you feel very trained after you have watched it, but it's still, I think, a very ex uh, important experience to go through. 
Then we have Tarkovsky's Stalker, which is another very deep, very layered film and also aesthetically absolute perfection. Yeah, if I had a if I was a film professor and I had to taught a class of like cinematography and stuff, this would definitely be a film that I would show. Like the colors again, the sepia tone and also the when it's just more normal color, it's beautiful that contrast and all the angles and and the place where they shoot. It's just all so interesting. And of course very important themes here about your or about the person's inner psyche. It's also about like kind of the supernatural in the way that whether there is something more to this world, is it just this kind of boring reality or whether there is something supernatural or whether there is something again um I guess you could say a divine in a way you can see in the end that yeah maybe the world isn't as quote unquote simple as we think. Yeah. I'm not doing a good job explaining that off the top of my head, but but yeah it's a very interesting film and I also like how all the characters represent different things and there's a very interesting kind of philosophical conf conflict and also psychological conflict there. And you can also look at this from a psychoanalytical way of those kind of your unconscious desires and stuff. Of course, psychoanalysis is all about the unconscious and the part of your brain that we cannot really see ourselves. Yeah. Then we have Yasuchiro Ozu's Tokyo Story film that is kind of like life itself, I would say. Again, another film that just tackles so many important themes about humanity. And it's so relatable, even though it's very Japanese. At the same time, and you can see that this is this list has quite a few Japanese films. Three out of ten is quite a quite a lot. Great performances. I love the Ozu aesthetic. It's so beautiful and it's so him, so unique. Um, yeah, it's such a beautiful universal film. Yeah. And even the even though that society has changed a lot since then and we see love in a different way. Parents don't have as much of a hold on their children anymore, not even in Japan. But it still feels relevant today and there is still so many things that you can connect to even today. Yeah. And then we have the Amplash of Cherbourg. This was actually something that I was really debating over whether I should have this or something else I, because I also wanted to have like a Bresson film, although with Bresson I never can decide which Bresson film it should be. And then I was thinking of Godard as well, maybe Vivre Savi. And my friends list actually has a has Vivre Savi and I cannot argue against that. But I thought that I wanted to have a again some French film here and I thought this is a such a great film. Of course in on the surface it might seem like oh yeah it's this whimsical musical romance, there's not that much more to it, but I think there is a lot there. there. There are even some political undertones there if you look at the film very de in a detailed way, and also I think love is very important. I think many men especially often kind of think that yeah, it's about love, it's not complex, it's stupid. Yeah, but love is the one good thing that we humans have. And it's very important to understand love and also understand that how it's not always enough you can, how, how you can see in this film. We see the young love blossoming, but then yeah, it doesn't end up lasting. And then there's this can be this bitterness and sadness, like we see in the, the end of like what could have been and in that brutal cast station scene and this is also aesthetic perfection it has a very queer type of aesthetic although i think there's no evidence that shock demi was bisexual or gay but it's just the aesthetic just screams that so much that i kind of have a suspicion that he might have been 
either gay or bisexual, but you never know. But whatever he was, the aesthetic is incredibly beautiful and colorful, and it shows you that that you can really play with the aesthetics and you can make over the top aesthetics and it can look very beautiful. Yeah. Okay, great performances as well. There's so much heart there. It has encompasses so many different emotions and that's very beautiful. And yeah, it's such a perfect movie. Yeah, it might not be as deep as the human condition or Sancho the Bailiff, but I think it's deep in its own way. And it tackles very important things as well, but in a very different way. And aesthetically, it is as perfect as any film ever made. So, yeah. Then we have Vertigo, and it's just, I think, an example of a perfect film. I don't really have that much to say about it, but I just think that it's just one of those films where I wouldn't say, change a single frame about it. And of course, this is a film that is always very high on the sight and sound list. I think it was the Second, yeah, it was the second in the previous one, and then 2012, it was the first one. But it's actually very interesting that even though this is a very universally loved film and critically acclaimed, but there are also so many people who seem to hate this film and think it's boring and misogynist and whatever, but I think it still holds up. I think it's an utter masterpiece, one of the best shot films of all time. And yeah, it's just such a masterpiece. But yeah, so many people seem to find it really boring. And yeah, I've read so many reviews like that. But but yeah, it's their own. It's their own, but I think it's great. And clearly Hitchcock's best film, even though he made many other great films like Rope and Psycho and North by Northwest and Rear Window, etc. But yeah, this was my top 10, but there were so many others that I could have gone with. Like I said, Pesson and Godard were really hard to leave out, and Fellini was really hard to leave out. Um, Hiros <laughs> fuck. Hiroshima Mona Moore was one I was thinking about as well. Yeah. Um, and of course there are so many, so many others, and even from many of the filmmakers that we discussed here, you could have chosen uh, other films. But then let's go to my alter egos list. So this is my top 10 ballot. As you can see, it's full of great classics. Some of these were on the sight and sound list. Some of them weren't. But I, of course, think that all of these should have been on the list. But as we all know, the latest sight and sound list was infested by woke ideology, radical feminism and transgender ideology and vegan ideology. So they decided to take a virtue signaling approach to the list and choose films from people of color and women, not because those films are actually good, but because they wanted to tick all those boxes, kind of like Paul Schrader said on Facebook. But, but yeah, my list is manly man's list. This is a carnivore's list. This is a perfect list full of amazing films that everybody can relate to. But let's go through this beautiful list. Now I'm so, so proud of this. I'm such an intellectual. Yeah. And what makes it even better, I was just watching eight hours of Joe Rogan and Jordan Peterson podcast. So I kind of feel this huge intellectual energy inside of me. So I'm really excited to continue that energy with talking about these masterpieces. Let's go through these films now. So we are going to start with The Dark Knight, which is from the greatest filmmaker of all time, the Messiah himself, Christopher Nolan. I've been a member of the Nolanism religion for over a decade now, and I've never been happier. But in this film, we see a billionaire teaming up with the police, surveilling citizens, putting citizens in order. I think some people say that it's a critique of that type of policy, you could say, but I think it's an endorsement of that. And those ideas are basically my politics in a nutshell. So I actually agree with that endorsement. So that's why I love this brilliant film. And of course, in a list like this, we need to have at least one comic book movie. And I think this is the 
most mature and the greatest of them all. So I had to have this. Yeah, it's the Dark Knight. Absolute perfection. Then the next film is David Fincher's Fight Club. It's his best movie, which is saying a lot, as I think he's one of the top five greatest filmmakers ever. So when I was in college, I had a huge poster of this on my wall. And I watched this film every week. And every person that I met, I told them immediately that Fight Club was my favorite movie, even though I'm not supposed to talk about it. But I went on a date once in college with this nice girl, or I thought that she was nice. And for small talk before we ordered our food, because we went to have dinner, she asked me what my favorite movie is, and I said, Fight Club. And she made this kind of funny face. She looked very disappointed. But she didn't leave yet. But I tried to explain why I love this movie. I said that it's kind of a manifestation of perfect masculinity and how I think men should behave this way. And she started laughing as, as she thought that I was making a joke. But then I said that I was serious. And then I started explaining her the 12 Rules for Life from Jordan Peterson. And I showed, showed her a couple of Andrew Tate clips from my phone. But then she left. I wonder why. But anyway, that's Fight Club, a perfect movie. Then we have Martin Scorsese's Goodfellas. And I love this basic Scorsese formula when we have these like really manly men rising and then they fall. They rise and they fall. They rise, Joe Pesci makes a fun joke and then they fall. That's such a perfect formula, very intelligent formula, very mature formula. And I really like it when directors can make a career of like doing one idea again and again and again and again. Decade after decade, I think that's so brilliant. And I wish that I could have a career like that in filmmaking, that I make the same movie like dozens of times again and again and again. Yeah. But I think this is the most perfect version of that brilliant formula that I just described. Again, this great man who, who want to be mobsters, they are so badass, they are funny, they are violent. They treat women like shit. That's the dream. Yeah. Great movie. Yeah. Then we have Nolan's Inception, the most complex film of all time. I've watched this 20 times and I still cannot explain what the movie is about. And actually on my 18th viewing, I noticed that some of the characters tried to explain the plot through the exposition, but I still couldn't understand the film. So please in the comment section, if you could explain this film to me, go ahead. I would love to know what it is about, but then again, it's such a complex movie that I think none of you can explain it either. So yeah, and it's aesthetically so brilliant. Roads going upside down. That's kind of even more insane than my own dreams. Yeah. The next film is Spielberg's Jaws. A brilliant movie. Again, I'm like a 12 year old in 26 year old man's body. So I absolutely love this film. I never grew up. I never want to grow up. Shark movies for life. Then we have Mad Max Fury Road. It's like a two hour YouTube travel vlog. And that's why I like it because I tend to prefer YouTube videos and TikTok clips to actual cinema. The next film on the list is Saving Private Ryan from Steven Spielberg, the greatest war film of all time. Full of American flags waving, tears, militarism, pro-America narrative. And that's why I love, love it. This is how you do a war film. It's like an ad for the American military. So sign up now, work for your country, and make your fellow citizens proud. Yeah. Absolute perfection. Then the next film on my list is The Shawshank Redemption. It's the number one film on the famous list, IMDb 250. And that's the reason it's on my list here too. Because if other people think it is the number one, then I must think that too. Because popular opinions are always the correct opinions. Yeah. Then I have so much nostalgia for the next one. It's Star Wars Episode 3. I still have 5,000 
Star Wars figurines on my shelves as I never grew up. I want to live like a child till the day I die. And this film still makes me so emotional. Like when Anakin says, if you are not with me, then you are my enemy. Like that utter anguish that we can see in his face. It makes me cry every time. And I'm still so wrapped up in the Star Wars universe. Every time I see a new Star Wars trailer, I shoot a reaction video and start crying. The nostalgia, the nostalgia. Yeah. I'm really glad that we live in a society now where, where adults are allowed to be children. Yeah. But what a brilliant film. Yeah. So the last film on my list is one of the most unique films ever. It's There Will Be Blood. It's about a toxic white guy who is greedy. It's about the American dream not working. I've never seen those ideas in a film before. I've never seen those ideas in literature before, but then again, I don't read. But even though it's the most unique film, and that's what I love about the film, and I love the aesthetics, I love the Daniel Day-Lewis performance, but I actually don't agree with the film's ideas, because I think the American dream is perfect. I think greed is good. I think it's great when billionaires hoard wealth and when children go hungry. I think that's a good way to run society. But this film and Paul Thomas Anderson seem to disagree with me. But again, I'm a conservative, so I believe in free speech and I believe in disagreement, so I don't mind that. But I love this film to death. But anyway, that was my top 10, very masculine top 10. No woke ideology here. Yeah, so hopefully you can watch all of these films and go subscribe to Jordan Peterson's YouTube channel as well to get enlightened and maybe consider starting the carnivore diet as well. But anyway, now I'm going to go back to myself and show you this good list from my great dear friend, Tony. So he made this list back in 2022, I think, showing his picks for uh, the site and sound list. And I think this is a really great list. Of course, it's a bit different than my list, although there are some overlap there as well. But we have Sherlock Jr., The Passion of Joan of Arc, Sean Show the Bailiff, which was also on my list, Butter Punch Charlie, Vivre Savi, that I considered to have on my list. At the Passion of Joan of Arc, I, by the way, also considered to be on my list. Uh, Persona was on my list. I went with Sherbrooke, but he went with Hosford. As he absolutely adores this film, we always gush about Jacques Demi when we talk to each other, which is always fun. Then Showa I also had on my list. Wings of Desire I desperately need to rewatch, which I have said for many years, but I still need to rewatch it. The Tree of Life is a good choice for a more recent film. And it's actually a funny thing about my list is that I think the newest film here is from, I think it's Showa from 1985. So I guess even though I'm a progressive, I'm 26 years old, I kind of still have an old soul, as I love these older films that much, but I could have had some more recent films like Mulholland Drive, Werkmeister Harmonies, for example, but yeah, this is my list. But anyway, let me know what you think of any of these top 10s, what you think of the sight and sound list. And yeah, thanks for watching. Don't drink Coke at all. Sayonara and Arigato gozaimasu.